thanks a lot, uh, Gabriel, to to be with us today. It's uh, it's really a pleasure. So uh, Gabriel is telling us about spontaneous symmetry breaking on surface defects, and uh, so please, uh, Gabriel, uh, the the stage yeah. is yours. Okay, so thanks a lot for the invitation. So um, it goes without saying. Please interrupt me any moment with questions. Um, I have some material, but if I don't cover it all, it's fine. Uh, I think I think it's more important that uh, anybody gets something out of this. Uh, so before starting uh, with the technical part of the talk, let me just uh, tell you I arrived at this question. So I am my research. So this work with a student is Tony Brook Shu Yu Zhang. That's uh, going, going to appear on JF, I think, in a few days. So, <clears throat> so the setup of today will be um, defects, in particular two-dimensional defects. And, and uh, I think the most important application of this setup is boundaries and interfaces in three-dimensional critical systems. So and the way we arrived at this question was based on a remarkable uh, recent work on the topic by Mats Metritsky that I want to review in the first two slides. Uh, apologize for the noise. So imagine you have your ON model that you can think of as an Hamiltonian in terms of nearest neighbor interacting spin with some coupling K. Now, uh, in infinite volume, there is a critical uh, value of this coupling K at which this model uh, flows in the infrared to the ON conformal field theory, so to the famous ON critical point. Now, if you have a boundary, so you have your system in infinite volume, but with a boundary at some point, then you are still free to leave the coupling in the bulk to be the critical one, but tuning arbitrarily the coupling at the boundary. So what does this do in the field theory language? Well, in the field theory language, this maps to having a critical ONCFT on half space that are roughly denote as the critical point on the quartic theory, for instance, the epsilon expansion, plus, and the coupling KB here maps to the first relevant deformation of the CFT on the boundary, which in this case would be the operator epsilon or in weakly coupled uh, schematic lambda wedge phi square. So the question that has been studied a lot in the literature that Max revisited recently is what is the fate of this theory? So what is the what are, are the critical exponent? What is the, the universality class of this boundary CFT? So roughly speaking, I think the answer for part of it is rather intuitive. So when the mass square here is positive, which corresponds to a sufficiently, I think, a small value of K, sufficiently large value of KB, then uh, to have spin fluctuating on the boundary costs you a lot of energy. So this means that roughly speaking, you will have a boundary condition that looks something like the in the weakly coupled limit, or in the strongly coupled statistical mechanics languages would be called ordinary boundary class, ordinary boundary condition. There is clearly a point at which we will actually associate with m square equals zero here, in which you'd pay no energy to have spin fluctuatings on the boundary. And this would correspond to something like Neumann boundary condition, or again, in CFT language, special uh, universality class. Um, and this is well established. We know the critical exponents associated with these uh, objects, with these two university conditions. The most interesting one for me today will be the one that you roughly associate to m square less than zero. So m square less than zero, clearly here you want to condense the scalar field near to the boundary, but then you have a potential in the bulk. So what's gonna happen is that you roughly the boundary condition for your bulk field will be something like one over distance from the boundary to the appropriate part for dictated by scale invariance times a unit vector that can point can point anywhere uh, in the ON space. And this coefficient here, I should say, it's not it's known from the bootstrap typically. And now two things can happen. So what was supposed to happen prior to Max's work is that this unit vector here has it akin to standard symmetry breaking would acquire an expectation value, something like this, and you would have spontaneous symmetry breaking on the boundary. So even if the, so the bulk theory at large distances will, uh, will preserve the symmetry, but close to the boundary, you will have expectation values for bulk fields and defect operators. However, if you're in the equal three, which is the physical setup for the UN model, the boundary is two dimensional. 
And I think, um, as you probably know, in 2D, there is the famous Coleman's theorem for bit symmetry break. Now, should this theorem apply to a boundary in a CFT? So I guess depending of uh, where you come from, either particle physics or condensed matter, you might have different, you might have different guesses. Uh, the usual guess, I think, in the condensed matter literature is that since the theory in the boundary in the presence of a gapless bulk is non-local, because the, non -lo the bulk mediates non-local interaction, since it's known, since already the old work by Mermin and Wagner, that non-local theory can violate Coleman's theorem, then there shouldn't, there is a priori not so much motivation to expect something special to happen equal free in this case. However, uh, is that what Max show is that the a sort of Coleman's argument applies in three dimension, and this unit vector here actually at a quantum level relaxes to zero, and there is no symmetry breaking. Um, the question that someone would, I want to address today, I will review, of course, the technicality of these stories as well later, but the main question I want to address today is whether this story is general. Namely, given a surface defect, such as a boundary and interface in a generic CFT, is it possible to break spontaneously the symmetry in general or not on a continuous internal symmetry or not? Uh, as an appetizer, the main conclusion of this work will be that uh, there is a version of Coleman's argument that you can argue at a somewhat non-perturbative level. And this version essentially tells you that spontaneous symmetry breaking cannot occur provided one condition is met, namely that the defect or G-flow terminates in a scale invariant fixed point or conformal invariant, of course, is good enough. And this scale invariant fixed point should admit uh, some um, conditions. The first is that dilation operator should have a discrete spectrum and that bulk operators retain their original scale dimension. This is roughly to say there should be a standard G-flow on the defect with nothing really happening on the bulk. So those of you familiar with the subject uh, know that this is what happened essentially in most cases or all cases you might think. However, these conditions are necessary because in fact it is possible to um, cook RG flows that actually violate these conditions. And if you cook these RG flows, you can see actually violation of this Coleman's argument. And as I will argue, this violation can really only happen in theories that have modular spaces. So they have flat direct, they have flat potential. So these are really non-generic theories, but for instance, it's possible in free theory, but it's trivial to construct uh, an example of symmetry breaking on a surface defect in free theory. But in interacting theory, you shouldn't expect that. Uh, actually, I think this argument should rule it out. So the rest of my talk will roughly be organized as follows. So I'll, I'll have a rather long introduction about defects and RG flows. Uh, please ask questions. There will be also some material, I think, some more material than uh, what is needed for this Coleman's theorem. Then I'll review the standard Coleman's theorem in two dimension, and I'll finally move to the um, surface defects. Okay, so defects and RG. So um, the setup is roughly the following. Um, so why do we study defects in physics? So defects are uh, extended objects in a quantum field theory. Again, we already saw the example of boundaries, but you can have impurities, uh, anions in fractional quantum all effects, uh, Google width and operators if you are into symmetric theories or interest in topological uh, defects and so forth so on. And P for me will always be the dimension of the defect. So D is the dimension of the bulk, including time, and P is the dimension of the defect. And uh, the viewpoint today will be that we will be interested in defects not because uh, what they teach us about the QFT, but because uh, defects describe objects of physical interest. And uh, rough, and the, what all these examples have in common is that they can often be studied within the viewpoint of QFT and most importantly, our G-flow, the normalization group flow. So there are two equivalent uh, viewpoints when you have a defect in a quantum field theory. So the first is to think that the defect could be a line, for instance, but is uh, uh, an extended operator of the bulk. So typically you have your fields and you'll write a non-local functional of your fields like this, or equivalently you will have some surface inside your flat space and you will specify a boundary condition on this surface. 
whatever way you choose to specify your defect, this you are regarding this object roughly as an operator of your theory. Even so, not an, a local one, but an extended one. A more somewhat uh, useful viewpoint, I think, for me, is to think that the defect rather modifies the action of the system in a co-dimension D minus P uh, surface. So this actually makes sense because if you think of quantizing your theory and you slice with time directions uh, in this way, then it's clear that at each moment in time, you will have both the different degrees of freedom and the bulk degrees of freedom to take into account. So you'll have a different Hilbert space than the one of the bulk of T. So it makes sense to think of this as a different system called different quantum field theory or different QT. So this will be my viewpoint today. Now, uh, different quantum, what are the symmetries of a different quantum field theory? So today I'll consider different in CFTs because the low energy uh, limit of every quantum field theory is a CFT as far as we know, in interesting unitary case for unitary theories. And a different uh, QFT may or may not preserve the a subgroup of the conformal group. So of course, a defect will always break translations because a boundary or an interface, for instance, will always uh, be placed at some point. So you will not have translations, but they, oh. they will preserve. Oh. Yes. I have a, well, maybe it's a very uh, naive question. But when you say defects, mm -hmm. uh, does it mean something more precise than having uh, like part of the theory that's described on a uh, lower dimensional part of your space? Uh, I think defect really means uh, any extended object in a field theory. So um, it's a very rough. So maybe you have something in mind that I'm not sure. Um, no, I, I was just wondering, because you started with um, like uh, an example where you have something living on the boundary of a, mm -hmm. 3D volume. Yes. So what you're saying is that defects can actually be more general than having something on the boundary of your Yeah. Domain. So for instance, you can have, uh, so this one, I will not talk about it today, but in the introduction to general, you can have a uh, line defects. So you can have your flat space. So say at, at T equals zero, you can insert any, any impurity at a point. Uh, it could be, uh, Wilson line, I don't know, I don't know exactly what context you're familiar with, but there are many examples. And this will extend in time. So from the viewpoint of QFT will be uh, a line defect. Uh, you can have interfaces between different theories. Uh, the formula is to describe all these things. It's roughly the same. So, but whatever I'll say today will apply both if you want to surfaces in a higher dimensional theory, interfaces or boundaries, as long as they are two dimensional. Because okay. the, really the formula is to describe them is the same. Even so, of course, probably boundaries in FD is still the most important application. I see. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, so. Again, um, a defect may or may not preserve um, some subgroup of the conformal group. So you have a CFT, it is invariant that the conformal transformations in group theoretical notations are this uh, group. So the maximal subgroup that the defect can preserve, think for instance of a boundary in, again, you know, if you want to have a concrete example, think of a 2D boundary in a 3D setup, is the conformal transformations along the boundary and the rotations around the uh, orthogonal directions so this would be yeah so oh, okay so not all boundaries uh, will preserve or not all defects will preserve of course uh, a subgroup of the uh, such a large subgroup of the conformal group for instance we saw before that we were writing at the extent in the first example some mass term along the boundary the master clearly is not conformal invariant so the statement that the defect preserves uh, as a group of the conformal transformations, it's really a dynamical statement. It's not just a statement of the fact that geometrically it's invariant under these transformations. So most general defects, most general or boundaries, again, if you want to have more concrete, it will not be uh, conformal. So we'll not preserve this p-dimensional conformal group. 
low, they, they will undergo a non-trivial RG flow. And this, and you can roughly think of this RG flow as a, a flow starting from some conformal point in the UV, some defect conformal point in UV, ending up in some point in the infrared that will generically be, again, conformal, a fixed point, but it must not necessarily be. That's how we will be. And uh, so roughly, when we think, when I study defects, the question we ask is, what can we say about this defect RG flow, either in a specific example or either what theorems can be proved in general about this RG flow? So this will be, again, the, in the in line of the motivation of my work, the idea is that um, we have these defects and they were, to understand their dynamics, it really means to understand what is the infrared fate. So it's useful to have constraints like Coleman's like theorems or monotonicity on the RG that tell us what can happen. So the first question you probably, okay, so let me first review uh, somewhat um, the non-perturbative viewpoints on defect safeties. So here I think I assumed uh, some familiarity with CMT language. So um, again, um, if, if not the case, please uh, tell me. But roughly what happens, so in CFTs, you have operators that, uh, that transform with certain scaling dimensions or critical exponents, and they have a certain fusion rules, some OPE coefficients. So in defect CFTs, you will still have bulk operators with their fusion rules, but in addition, you'll have operators living on the defect. Now, in weakly coupled example, the operator living on the defects might be simply related to the operator living in the bulk. For instance, you have phi in the bulk, you can write phi on the boundary. However, at the strongly coupled level, operators on the defect and operators in the bulk, they really are different objects. So they have different scaling dimension and so forth. So, so the best we can say is that deep operators on the defects are classified uh, by their quantum numbers under the p-dimensional conformal group and some time transfer rotations, which is to say they have some scaling dimensions, most importantly, for in the case of a plane defect, for instance, that uh, need not to coincide with the bar scaling dimension. And um, if you want, these are the DCFT critical exponents. Addition, there is some fusion algebra that relates bulk operator to defect operators. The way to read this formula here is that when you bring an operator in the bulk close to the defect, so X transverse is the direction is the distance from the defect, you have sort of a Taylor expansion in terms of defect operators with coefficients that are theory dependent and powers that depend on the scaling dimension of this operator and the defect operator. So finally, the way to have energy is pretty much as in the initial example is to start with some defect CFT, which could be some uh, free boundary or like no defect at all, and then integrate along a surface an operator which has dimension less than P. So relevant means for defect dimension less than P. For instance, before we were integrating the operator phi square along the boundary, this was triggering a non-trivial RG flow. Okay, so what can we say about this operation? I think that's roughly the question about what can we say about RG. So remarkably, um, owing to efforts in the latest in over, I think, well, most recently six or seven years, but I think the story really dates back to Affleck and Lublin in 91 and Friedan and Konech in 2003. We now uh, understand that this defect RG flow is um, mono, is um, irreversible. So we know that bulk energy flows are irreversible in dimension less than or equal than flow, than four, this has been proven. And the same techniques roughly allow you to prove that also defect energy flows are irreversible. Some other proof is really dependent on the number of dimensions of the defect. But roughly the, argument, the result is the following. You take the expectation value of the defect placed on a circular contour. If you, if you had a boundary, you have to make a conformal transformation from fat space to uh, a ball, and then your theory will be living inside this ball. In the case of an interface, of course, this separates just space. Now, the expectation value of the defect on this ball, which is the, if you want the partition function for the defect on a, a spherical contour, you, you can prove it's a pure number for odd dimensional defects or a logarithm of this radius for even dimensional defect. Up to, up to terms which are, are roughly the characterized counter terms, which are 
essentially UV divergent term that you need to subtract, but we know how to do it systematically. But roughly speaking, forget about this part. We know it's a constant for odd dimensional defect, like line defects or three dimensional boundaries in for this space and a log grid in, for instance, for boundaries in three dimensions. The statement is that this quantity F that appears here is actually energy monotone. So in the UV, this axis will be larger than in infrared. So the UV and the infrared are roughly associated, if you want, to R equals zero, so the very small defect, and R equal to infinity, so the very large defect. So this theorem guarantees that the RG is uh, irreversible. I should say that strictly speaking, this theorem has been proven only for P less or equal than four, which is probably all the cases you might care about, even though okay, some people care about six dimensional theories and 5D boundaries, but okay, most cases that you might care about. And also let me say that uh, the theory in the absence of a defect, this for instance, okay, this doesn't really make sense for a boundary, but for an inter, but for instance, for a, an interface between two equal theory, this makes sense. S is equal to zero. So if you start, if you insert a, a surface in a theory which has no defect, in the infrared, you will have S less than zero. So I think to exemplify this result, it's good to look at examples. Uh, so I'll skip this, I think. So the first example that I want to consider, which probably will make things slightly more concrete, is to have a free theory in the bulk with uh, one symmetry. And then you can the simplest uh, thing you can do is to in integrate a linear term on a surface into dimension. So in 3D, this would be an interface between two equal theories. In four dimension, this is just a surface embedded in four dimension. It's an operation I can always do. You can roughly think of it as, as turning on a magnetic field on a surface. Okay, so this is a trivial theory. It's a free theory. You can solve it. So you, um, this is a source for your uh, scalar field, you solve the equation of motion, and you find that one point function is scalar field, of course, points in the direction one because you're breaking the symmetry on the surface. And it decays like one over the distance from the defect to the power d minus four times the coefficient h. Uh, let me remark h as positive mass dimension, as positive mass dimension as long as the dimension of the bulk are smaller than six. So, okay, it's a bit of a, okay, let's say why am I caring about five and six dimensions, but I think just for the sake of having an example, it's good to consider arbitrary D. And don't worry, I'll talk about more physical examples in a moment. And uh, so you see that, okay, so this is, the, so you see that, this one point function in D less than six is proportional to a coefficient which is dimensionful times this distance. So the fact that there is a dimensional coefficient here tells you right away one thing that uh, this one point function is not conformal. So this is what I was saying before that not all defects will be conformal at large distances. So a conformal one point function should be one over x to the power of the scale dimension of phi, which is d minus two over two. Uh, still, you can check the monotonicity of the RG. And to do that, you have to compute the quantity S that I wrote before as a function of R. Um, here, you have to subtract the counter terms. So there is a, you can do it through these differential operators, but details do not matter too much. This is the S I wrote before, really. And you see that if you take the limit R to infinity, which is the same of computing S I R, and if D is less than six, this goes to minus infinity. This is the result. So in the UV, you have S equals zero. In the IR, you have S equal minus infinity. So the RG flow is indeed monotonic. You see that the infrared fixed point is smaller S. However, somewhat unpleasantly, this S never stops decreasing. So it becomes, so the partition function of defect just becomes zero. And um, this means that we call this kind of examples runaway RG flows. And this behavior is associated again with the fact that this one point function is not conformal. 
So how is it possible that we never reach a conformal fixed point? Um, it's probably, I think, let me remark it. I think here it's clear, why is it that the scalar field can, uh, can be so large? So it's clear that here it's possible because the bulk theory doesn't have a potential. So this coefficient h is dimensionful, so I can tune it to be arbitrarily large. So in this example, I can make the scalar field very big at large distances just by tuning this coefficient h. Clearly, in a theory that had some potential for the scalar field, this could not happen. The potential would counter-react and would tell you, no, you should not make the bulk field too large because you pay a price. Here, instead, you don't pay any price because the theory has no potential. So the general lesson is that uh, the RG is always monotonic. Sometimes it may not end in conformal fixed points, but when it doesn't end in conformal fixed point, we believe this is because the bulk theory doesn't have, does have flat, flat direction, so a moduli space in safety language. So a slightly more um, less uh, slightly less trivial but more interesting example is to do the same defect. So integrate a source in the two-dimensional surface in the critical one theory. So the critical one theory again you can roughly think of it as the critical point of your five four scalar theory. So now you can study this theory. First, in the epsilon expansion close to four dimension, it's trivial. You just have to solve the equation of motion with this source, and now you find that at large distances the scalar field decays with a conformal power law, which is in third dimension would be one over X. And in, uh, in D dimension, okay, you have to do epsilon expansion or you have to believe uh, the numerics that people have been doing Monte Carlo, but it's one over X to a scalar in dimension of phi with a coefficient that is co calculable from non-perturbative methods. So this point, this defect does reach a conformal fixed point. You can compute in the epsilon expansion at large n the value of s. This has been done in these papers. I will not review it. You find that it's smaller than zero. So again, the theorem works. And uh, a remark that will come back later is that this defect is also somewhat special in that it is explicitly breaking the n symmetry. So I'm writing phi one in one direction. I could have written phi two or phi three. So I could have written the a source term in any direction in the n space. Clearly, all these defects in which I just rotate uh, the direction of, uh, the, of the field in the one space here must be equivalent up to triv a trivial operation. So in the language of uh, boundary CFT or defect CFT, this means that there must be some marginal deformation of my infrared defect that moves me from one to the other. And indeed, there is such marginal deformation here, non-perturbatively is called the tilt operator. And it's really roughly, you can think of it as uh, rotating this field, which at a linear order is just inserting phi 2 or phi 3 in this action, or phi n in this action. OK, so questions on this uh, defect RG? Going a bit slow. OK, so. Um, the main goal of uh, today's talk was to go to Coleman's theorem. So let me review Coleman's theorem uh, in the bar QFTs. So the theorem states that spontaneous symmetry breaking cannot occur in con for continuous internal symmetries in two dimensions. It's sometimes called the Mermin Wagner theorem. I call it Coleman's theorem because Mermin Wagner, strictly speaking, proved it for uh, um, lattice, a specific lattice model, the Eisenberg model. Today, I really want to talk uh, about the continuous version, the field theory version, which was proven by Coleman. So roughly the argument uh, for in QFT is rather simple. And the idea is that proceed by contradiction. So you assume that you have some order parameter, which is not invariant under the action of some symmetry charge Q. In particular, a whole set of charges Q that span a cos at G over H, not too important. In this case, uh, you have a world identity that if you take the Euclidean two point function of the conserved current and the order parameter, you have a delta function on the right hand side with the variation of the order parameter. This world identity actually completely specifies this current. So the way to see this is to write the current in momentum space and use Poincare invariance or Euclidean invariance because I'm in Euclidean really. And that's what you find. So the current is as a pole in one over p square up to 
turns proportional to an epsilon tensor. So up to polity violating turns that really do not play a role for me. Now, um, a one over p square pole in field theory is well known to imply the existence of master squared. So you have to imply the spectral decomposition and you conclude that there are massless particles, which are the Goldstone bosons. And not only that, you conclude that these Goldstone bosons have non-trivial matrix element with the order parameter O. Okay, so this is Goldstone theorem. Now, um, Goldstone theorems, so what can I, the important point is that, that there is not only the existence of massless particles, but they know that these massless particles have a matrix element with my order parameter. Therefore, if I want to compute the spectral density for the order parameter, which is roughly inserting a complete set of state between O dagger and O, I know that I will have the contribution of many states here. Some of them will be the Goldstone bosons, and the rest will be something else. Okay. This matrix M is just the product of the matrix Z is defined here. Importantly, so if you assume unitarity, which is the the other key ingredient of the theorem, both, the, both this matrix M and this delta rho will be positive. So now all you have to do, this tells you if you insert this in the two-point function of the order parameter, that the two-point function of the order parameter will become very negative at large distances. The way to prove that is to take the two-point function of the order parameter. You take a derivative with respect to log of the distance between the two operators. You get this expression here. So this is some Bessel function. The important point is that it is positive. And eventually, after some simple algebra, you realize that this, this minus this derivative is actually larger or equal in the matrix sense of the contribution of the Goldstone bosons, which itself is larger or equal than zero. So if you integrate these equations, you find immediately, sorry, I don't know what happened. If you integrate this equation, you find immediately the order parameter two-point function must be smaller at large distances the minus log of the distance times this matrix, roughly speaking. So this means that this two-point function at large distances will violate um, both, ref sorry, both reflection positivity and cluster decomposition principles. So this two-point function will not reduce to the expectation value of two one-point functions and will not be positive. Both things are incompatible in a local, both things must be wrong in a good quantum field theory, in a unitary QFT. So this is roughly the theorem. Um, okay, so that's some remarks about this theorem. The maybe mean, main remark I want to make is that the physical meaning of this theorem is well known. The fact that this two-point function goes like a logarithm would grow like a rotary if you had spontaneous symmetry breaking. It's really the consequence that the propagator of massless particle grows with the distance, which physically means if you have a system with massless particle and you are in an ordered phase, you make a small perturbation at a point, then this small by quantum fluctuation, then this perturbation will propagate at arbitrary large distance and then it will eventually destroy the ordered phase. So ordered phases are unstable due to quantum fluctuation. So that's why it's important when a quantum field theory or a statistical field theory. And the theory relies on unitarity and Poincaré invariance. In fact, it's easy to, con to construct counterexamples if you violate either of these assumptions. Um, yeah, so that's a bunch of other comments. Another one is that Coleman's theorem forbids ordered parameters, not massless particles. So if you don't have order, there is no problem with having massless particles, for instance, you know, standard free boson CFT in 2D. And it's also important that the to prove Goldstone theorems and therefore Coleman's theorem, the word identity constrains a correlation function of local operators. Okay, so let me skip the last comment. So you might be more familiar with examples. So the standard example is the 2D sigma model, the ON model. 
you roughly it's just Sorry, the Gabriel, can you just remind me quickly where the, the assumption about the locality of the theory enters in the proof? Ah, yes, sir. Yeah, so it enters at this step. I should have said it. So once you have a once there is no locality of the tiers, locality, well, locality of the theory, of course, because we're using the word identity. So what I'm using is that a pole in a two-point function of two local operators implies a non-zero matrix element between this operator and massless particles. If I had a non-local operator here, some uh, integrated operator, then I wouldn't be able to conclude that there is a massless particle with such matrix element. This will be important before, afterwards in the defect, you probably already see it, because there the word identities are more involved. And the same constraint will involve non-local operators. So, for example, like in the Schwinger model and all these uh, these these models where you have uh, some you have non-local potential that, uh, that mm -hmm. for which then in in it, it, it is for this reason that uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking is allowed. Yeah. So in, in uh, so if you have a if the model is just purely non-local, then you don't even have the word identity to start with. So see, this word identity uses locality in a sense that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and it's known, I mean, already in Mermin Wagner's paper, I was saying at the beginning, they pointed out that generic non-local model can violate the Coleman's theorem, essentially because they are long range interact. They also never allowed to have non linear interaction that change the propagator. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so let me skip this. Okay, so the, let me remind you the standard example or explain the standard example, which is the two D sigma model. So I'll think of this 2D sigma model just as a theory for a, a vector n constraint. There is a cap in G which is marginal. And I'm adding also a magnetic field in one direction, which I think of it as an infrared regulator. The theory is strongly coupled for n larger than two. So in the ON model for n larger than two is strongly coupled. The way you see it, you compute the beta function of this G is well known. And then you find that the coupling explodes at a scale which is given in terms of the initial scale by this formula, the standard example of dimensional transmutation. And this is reflected in the fact that uh, if you compute stuff in perturbation theory, you find infrared divergences. For instance, if you compute the one point function of the order parameter n, or the would be order parameter n, you find that it is one minus gamma n, gamma n is this expression here, is the anomalous dimension of the operator n, times a logarithm of the infrared regulator divided the scale mu. So this logarithm clearly explodes in the limit h to zero, where they say my infrared regulator to zero. So this is typically the reason why people say perturbation, you know, that's how people discover perturbation theory doesn't work in these models really. However, I still can do perturbation theory as long as my, as long as my infrared regulator is large enough, or if I am for n equal two, for instance, in that case, you can resum these logarithms, at least as long as this condition is satisfied. And then you find that the one point function of the order parameter is actually a power law. It's just the kalan zimanzik equation tells you that. And the power law, the power of this power law is dictated by the anomalous dimension of the field. So this equation is telling us that the expectation value of n is going down as I make the infrared regulator small. So roughly, and the reason why it's going down is because this power is positive. So this power is positive means that the anomalous dimension of the field is positive, and this is a consequence of unitarity. So you see, and this is how you see that actually this model doesn't really break the symmetry at the quantum level. If you don't believe these perturbative arguments, which are anyhow completely rigorous for n equal two, you can also solve this model uh, by integrability, and then you find that the model is indeed gapped. This, I think, is the homological solution of this model. So famously, uh, this is a, but I think the naive way in which you would realize that there is something going on is that there are infrared divergences in two dimensions. In higher dimension, there wouldn't be any. Okay, so there is a generalization of these two arbitrary nonlinear sigma models. Uh, I think I want to skip it in the interest of time, but it's roughly the same story for arbitrary sigma model. So let's go to surface defects. Okay, so before, I told you before the Coleman's theorem, the first ingredient was world identity. So I have to review the world identities for defects. So if you have a theory, say with a boundary, 
the current will be conserved everywhere in the bulk because of course the boundary is at a point, it's at localized. But in general, the defect may modify the conservation laws on, on the defect itself. And essentially by assumption, because I would say if the defect is local, but it's essentially by assumption, the defect modifies its conservation laws with a local operator on the defect. So the conservation of the bulk current will be modified by a term that lives on the defect times a defect operator T. Um, there are two cases now. This defect operator T may either be zero or a total derivative in general along the defect. In this case, you have see in this case you can still can construct a charge associated with this uh, uh, current A. I call it charge QA, and the D and the C defect preserves the symmetry. So every time you have a defect that preserves the symmetry, this operator T must either be zero or a total derivative. And this uh, and the corresponding defect current is this G hat. It may be like in the example of the source defect before that this operator T is actually not a total derivative. This means that the defect breaks explicitly the symmetry. In this case, the operators T are called tilt operators. And I think as I remarked in the previous example, tilt operators have protected scaling dimension. Delta of T should be equal to P. Okay, so this follows essentially from this identity because the current has dimension D minus one, the derivative of current has dimension D, the delta function has dimension D minus P. So if there is a well-defined scale invariance in the theory, the, the tilt operator must have dimension P as well. It's very simple. Let me say that the existence of this tilt operator when you break explicit asymmetry on a surface was realized already in this, uh, all the works on the boundaries in the UN model. Now let's try to run Kalman's argument again. Again, we suppose we have an order parameter that breaks spontaneously the symmetry. The word identity now will involve the bulk current and the defect current in general with the delta function. So this would be your world identity. Now we only have translations along the direction parallel to the to the uh, to the defect. So I'm not assuming that the defect is conformal, of course. I'm being completely general for now. So this means that to to actually that this world identity is due to the lack of uh, full Poincare symmetry. Just I just have it along the defect. You can easily get convinced that the best you can do is to constrain the two-point function of the order parameter with this non-local operator, which is the sum of the defect current plus the bulk current integrated along the transfer space. You might even complain that this operation may not converge. I have nothing against this complaint. I just say, even if you assume that this integration is well-defined, the best you can do is conclude that there is indeed a pole in this two-point function, but it's a pole in a two-point function of a non-local operator. Now. Um, I will not review in detail this argument, but I think it's clear that uh, I think you can easily believe me that a pole in a two-point function for a non-local operator doesn't necessarily require the existence of massless particle. To be sure that there are massless particles, you would need to know that this pole appears in the correlation function of the defect current itself with the defect operator. In that case, there will be a pole in a two-point function of local operators. And this happens whenever the delta function here receives a contribution from the two-point function of the defect current and the defect operator. But this doesn't need to be the case. So this could contribute to something else. This could have a delta function plus something else that cancels whatever comes from here. So in other words, to prove Goldstone's and Coleman's theorem, we need this condition here, which is stronger than this condition here. Physically, what is going on? Physically, what is going on is we didn't yet used any input about the fact that we don't want symmetry breaking in the bulk. I want a theory that does symmetry breaking on the defect, but far away, the symmetry is restored. So clearly, if I use the general world identities, I will never get any farther. So I need to input this. Unfortunately, or maybe interesting, it turns out that the condition we need is even stronger. And in fact, it's, uh, it's not only sufficient, I'll show it's such a necessary condition. And the condition is the one I stated at the beginning. We need to assume something about the infrared of the defect quantum field theory. So the defect QFT must flow to a scale invariant fixed point, potentially plus irrelevant deformations. 
such that the dilation operator admits a discrete spectrum and bulk operators retain their UV screen dimension. So I don't only need that the, the expectation value of, of a bulk operator vanishes at a distance from the defect, I also need that it vanishes fast enough such that the defect is conform, essentially. That's the message. In equations, what I mean is that your defect quantum field correlation function, if your defect theory, the infrared will be described by those of a scale invariant or generically conformal theory plus potentially relevant deformations. And correlation function of the order parameter will be described by correlation function of a sum of operators to which this uh, order parameter flows to. Particularly if there is symmetry breaking, it will flow to the identity times the expectation value plus operator with scaling dimension larger than zero. So my claim is that under these assumptions, the bulk current cannot contribute to a delta function in the world identity. So it means that the delta function will need to be saturated by the defect currents. And then I could run the same argument as before. Uh, the sketch of the proof is as follows. Uh, you have this, imagine that in this correlation function of the bulk current and the defect operator, you add actually a delta di di an identity here. Now, a delta function transforms with weight D under the conformal group. And the derivative of the current transforms with weight D under the conformal group. So the defect operator here must transform with weight zero. In other words, the operator O hat, the defect order parameter, must flow to a dimension zero operator. However, it's easy to prove in a scale invariant field theory with discrete operator spectrum, all dimension zero operators must be topological. In fact, in CFT, generically, the only dimension zero operator we have is the identity whose correlation function do not, do not depend on the distance. So this means that here the assumption depends on the distance. This is topological, so this is inconsistent. You can ask, okay, what about irrelevant deformations? But it's simple by spurious analysis to realize that irrelevant deformation will contribute to terms which are suppressed by some UV scale, and therefore cannot saturate this term here, which has the same weight as the current here. In other words, under this assumption, this equation must be false. Um, let me also remark, you might, be, you might be a bit disturbed that I'm talking about infrared here and I'm talking about a delta function here, but this is a delta function of world identity. So it's a non-local thing. So for instance, the way to see it, you could integrate this correlation function a very large ball. And by Gauss theorem, you would pick a contribution from this. So if you want, you could integrate uh, G mu O on a surface and Gauss theorem will tell you that I will receive a contribution for this delta function. So really a delta function in world identity tells you about the long distance limit of the correlation function. So it's not a, it's not a contact term. It's not just a contact term in the correlation function. So the main upshot of this is that this delta function must come from the defect currents under these assumptions. And once, and therefore the two-point function of defect current with the other parameter will satisfy this world identity plus irrelevant terms that can be canceled by the contribution of the bulk current. So now we are in the same setup. Now I can just plug completeness. Okay. So now I can just plug completeness here as I was doing before. Use the spectral decomposition and prove Goldstone theorem and so forth so on by quantizing a time direction parallel to the effect. Of course, we'll have more uh, quantum numbers besides that the translate, I will have the translations along the defect plus a plethora of quantum numbers, but still I can use, uh, can classify states according to the mass square in the, in the momenta along, parallel to the defect. So this means that at this point, I can conclude the existence of p-dimensional Goldstone bosons, which physically means that if the theory flows to a scale invariant fixed point and breaks spontaneously the symmetry on the defect, then there will be there will be a decoupled Goldstone sector. And if I extend this argument to p equal two, then spontaneous symmetry breaking will not be possible by Coleman's argument. Okay, so questions on this? Okay, so let me exemplify this with a free theory example again. So the simplest, before we study this free theory example of a source in free theory, 
and this is the one point function. Now, this example is nice because the example is conformal only in D equals six. So to see if they are, if the assumption we made before actually is sufficient, we could think of modifying in a minimal way this example and see what happens in D less than six and in D equals six. So the minimal modification of this example that actually um, is suitable for what I want to do is to couple the free field, not anymore to a explicit breaking, but to a 2D sigma model that classically breaks spontaneously the symmetry. But uh, as we saw before at the quantum level, things are more subtle. Okay, so my model is the scalar field, then my ON sigma model, and then a linear coupling between the two. Now I can ask, in the local stigma model, there is no symmetry breaking, but can this coupling modify things and lead to symmetry breaking on the sigma model? So the answer is that it's yes. In D less than six, spontaneous symmetry breaking persists at the quantum level in this surface defect. Sorry, Gabriel, can you go back one slide? Yes. Ah, okay, okay, fine. Now I see how the two theories are uh, coupled. Sorry. Yes, they're coupled through this stuff. Sorry. Yes. So this is kind of mean, if you expand then around uh, one plus fluctuation, you would uh, recover this coupling plus fluctuations. The question is that before quantum fluctuation were important, they, they asked the question is whether they will still be now. So um, to see this, the simplest thing is to integrate, to see what happens, the simplest thing is that to integrate out uh, the scalar field, you integrate out the scalar field, you can do it. This coupling is linear, so you can do it exactly. And then expand then around fluctuations. I'll spare you the details. What happens is that the propagator of the Goldstones is not anymore one over P square, but it's one over P square plus something which is proportional to alpha zero P D minus four. And I'll take D larger than four so that, um, yeah, let's work in D larger than four so that this coefficient is positive. Otherwise the story is more subtle. So the coefficient, okay, is some bunch of gamma function, but you can easily get convinced that it's positive and finite for between the, between four and six. In particular, in five dimension is positive and finite. Now, the fact that the propagator goes as this extra term, this extra term acts a bit like a mass term, like an infrared regulator. It's a softer, it has a softer behavior, small p, than the p squared term. So before I told you that the way you, would intuitively see the absence of, of symmetry breaking in the sigma model was computing the one point function of the order parameter and finding an infrared divergence. Now, if you do the same calculation here, you see that there is no infrared divergence whatsoever, but rather this coefficient alpha zero, which is finite, regulates the logarithm. And therefore, if you take the RG scale to be of order of this alpha zero to the appropriate power, there is no interesting RG flow. In particular, if you choose alpha zero to be much larger in the strong coupling scale that you can always scan through tuning H, this one point function is just finite with a finite uh, perturbative correction and spontaneous symmetry breaking persists at a quantum level. Okay. This is not so surprising if you know about the non-local one model. The non-local one model is roughly a model in which the spins in 2D interact via non-local potential of this form. And this non-local potential is actually the same as the one induced by the bar scalar field. I wrote it in the, scale, in the right notation. And already Mermin and Wagner pointed out that if this power doesn't fall faster than one over X to the four, so if D is less than six in my language, then this model can break, uh, we can violate Coleman's theorem. So again, we are just finding in a different language uh, the result of Mermin and one of the results of Mermin and Wagner paper. The interesting thing though, is that in the defect language, this is a trivial example, but we see that it's associated with a somewhat non-trivial behavior. That is the fact that the theory never reaches a fixed point. So I, I didn't write it down here, I forgot, but the one point function of the scalar field in this model will still decay like X D minus four. So which is not conformal. So for this less than six, this model is not conformal. And that's why it can violate the theorem we had before. In D equals six, instead, the source defect was actually conforming. In other words, the coupling H is dimensionless. 
So we should now, two things can happen a priori. It could be that uh, the coupling to the uh, sigma model makes this theory flow to a non-conformal defect and breaks spontaneously the symmetry, or that the system remains conformal, there is no symmetry breaking. As it turns out, the second one happened. First of all, you have to notice that the calculation I did before doesn't extend to the equal six. That's because the coefficient alpha zero at some gamma function, so it has a pole as you go to the equal six. So you have to, and whenever you have a pole as you're used from dimensional organization, means that there is some non trivial RG flow. Okay, since some my time is running up, I will not explain the calculation, but roughly you have a beta function for the coupling H, which is classically marginal and a beta function for the cap in G. And the interesting point is the beta function of the cap in G is a nonlinear sigma model at just this piece. Now it's modified by this star. Okay, so now you have to study this system of beta functions. You have to integrate them. Um, so the only non-trivial fixed points of these beta functions are obviously just when G is equal to zero, because you need this to be zero and this to be zero, and both happen only when G is equal to zero. However, and you can play with these equations and you can do essentially um, perturbation theory around any potential uh, fixed point. And you see that there is no stable, these fixed points, this fixed point G equals zero is never reached as long as you start with physical initial condition G squared larger than zero. I'm not proving this, I'm just claiming. I mean, I proved it, it's proven in the paper, but I'm not proving it now. What you instead find is that all RG flows start with G squared larger than zero are such that the coupling H eventually goes to zero. H was the coupling of the bulk to the defect. So it means that in the deep infrared bulk and defect the couples. So then you have the, on the defect, you have the same physics of the local one sigma model in the bulk, you just have a decoupled free theory. And the physics of the local one sigma model, we reviewed it before, is the physics, there is no symmetry breaking, there is no strong quantum fluctuations. So this model is actually conformal, but doesn't admit any symmetry break. So finally, let me uh, quickly discuss the extraordinary boundary conditions in the UN model, which was my the original paper, which was a uh, review for the work of Max. So roughly speaking, we are thinking of our critical theory with a master on the boundary. And I'll take the mass work to the negative so such that the scalar field wants to condense. Now to study this model is kind of complicated. It's a very long RG flow. In particular, we want to do it in 3D where the boundary is two dimensional. So Max came up with a very smart idea and said, okay, we don't really care about this particular action. We care about actions in the same universality class. And he argued that there is a simple way to write actions in the same universality class. And this simple way is written via three terms, the, which I'll detail in the next slide. So the first term is the, the defect CFT that breaks explicitly the symmetry. So roughly is this model here. And this one I showed in some of my slides before. In this defect CFT, okay, it's a strongly coupled, it's strongly coupled, but we, there is no mystery about Coleman's theorem and so forth so on because uh, the, the symmetry breaking is explicit. So there is a one point function for phi one. So in this theory, there is phi one as some one point function. And, uh, and so forth so on, there are a bunch of different CFT data that people have computed. The nonlinear sigma model theory is a standard ghost transaction that I reviewed already. The interesting thing is that if you figured out that if you couple this action which breaks explicitly the symmetry and this action which has a symmetry on the boundary via a specific term, which at leading order is just the Goldstone boson times the tilt operator, then this coupling restores the one symmetry in this term here. So the full action the explicit symmetry breaking one, the nonlinear sigma model, and the coupling is all together invariant under one symmetry. The proof is essentially straightforward. You have to recall that in the explicit yeah. symmetry breaking Gabriel, theory. Gabriel, you, are, you have like three minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm done. 
So you have to recall it that in the explicit symmetry breaking theory, the bulk current satisfies this world identity. And then you have to use the equation of motion, the nonlinear sigma model, plus this coupling to show that the tilt operator is actually proportional to the derivative of the currents of the Goldstone bosons. So these two equations together tell you that there are world identities. Now, at this point, the fate of the system, now the, the physical question is whether this coupling is relevant or irrelevant. So if it's irrelevant, even though the system has one symmetry, in the infrared, you will roughly, the Goldstones will decouple, and the bulk theory will roughly look like the explicit symmetry breaking one. So this term is irrelevant if you canonically normalize the field when d is larger than three or d minus one is larger than two. It cannot be irrelevant by our theorem when d minus one is equal to two. And in fact, in that case, this coupling is marginal and uh, modify, and therefore you can study the, in this case, modifies the beta function on linear sigma model as before, and you can study the system. So in the interest of time, I will not detail the study, but at this point, let me just say that three things can happen. So the beta function of the system is this, with a coefficient that depends on the normalization of the two-point function of tilt operator. So this was alpha, but only this term in the local model, there is an extra term here. Now this coefficient C, we don't know it at the non-perturbative level, but three things can happen. If alpha is less than zero, then the coupling flows to G flows to strong coupling, and we expect that the sigma model gets capped out. Well, we know, and in this case, the boundary the, the boundary class will be that of the standard Dirichlet boundary conditions, so no symmetry breaking. If alpha is equal to zero, okay, this depends on subleading corrections. We don't really know, but it's presumably nothing special is going to happen. If alpha is larger than zero, he said G is marginally relevant deformation. So we have a situation where we have a defect CFT with a marginally relevant deformation, which is this coupling G. And this is precisely the situation where the former theorem I showed applies, and there cannot be any symmetry breaking. And uh, Max, in fact, showed this explicitly in this model by solving uh, in perturbation theory for one and two point functions. Because when the coupling is marginally relevant, you can do some conformal perturbation theory. And I will not do it now in the interest of time, but uh, let me just say that the absence symmetry break in this case follows from a more general argument. Okay, so this was it. Okay, so let me just conclude. Um, I talked about symmetry breaking on surface defects. I gave an argument for why it's impossible assuming a reasonable condition on the LG flow. I gave you a counter example showing that the condition I argued for is actually necessary. And I told you that essentially counterexamples are possible only in theories with moduli spaces. So in your statistical mechanics model, you'll typically be fine. And uh, I didn't have much time to sell, say this, but Max also argued the existence of a generic uh, universality class where creation function decay logarithmically for this class of two-dimensional defects. And we generalized it in the paper. There are some questions I did the examples I show you of symmetry breaking surface defects were really well defined only between four and six dimensions, between five dimensions, but we really did not construct any example of spontaneous symmetry breaking surface defects in 3D. And additionally, it would be very nice to study um, more, better what are the conditions to have symmetry breaking or discrete symmetries on line defects. So we know that in quantum mechanics, um, under some condition, spontaneous symmetry breaking is forbidden in general, also for discrete symmetries. The analogous question in the case of defects would be what can we say about line defects and discrete symmetries on them? And the people have been thinking about this. There are some claims, but still we lack proof. And with this, I thank you all. Thank you, Gabriel. So, um, are there uh, any questions from the audience?
Yeah, Gabriel, but by the way, I think uh, I'm not sure if uh, it is correct to think about it in this way, but uh, mm -hmm. indeed, uh, like, um, the, so if you if you think of the 1D long range, long range uh, easing model as, as a mm -hmm. defect, which is something uh -huh. that more or less, uh, you know, it's a trick, but uh, you can do it. Mm -hmm. But then I think, uh, I'm not completely sure, but I think uh, there there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking of Z2. Yeah, so the, the point is that all this, whenever you do this trick, so the although it is the way you think of the 1D C model as a trick, as a defect, is the same trick I did here. You couple the surface to a free field. Yes. So the, whenever you, and the free field is precisely the class of bulk theories that have this uh, um, runaway RG flows that never reach fixed points. No, but, but wait a second. In this case, it will be... Um... Like a line defect in some non uh, non integer codimension. So yeah, yeah. So it will be a line defect coupled to a free field in some non integer dimension, but it's yes. still a free field. So the free field yes. is the, the the kind of bulk theory where the uh, defect or G flow is allowed not to terminate at uh, scale invariant fixed points, and that's precisely like in this this example here. You can have symmetry breaking. Mm -hmm. So if you want the no go theorem is like in many non-local models, it's known that they can break spontaneously the symmetry. But I'm just a bit confused because uh, like there is, uh, so if you do it, if you try to compute, uh, uh, if you try to compute, if you, if you try to find uh, um, an infrared fixed point for the 1D long range easing model, you, you would find some. So the, but, the, I mean, the, the question is, uh, um, it will terminate into a defect safety. The one D long range IC model. Yes, absolutely depends. So, oh, on... Okay, sorry. So let, let me also say one thing. So the one D. Okay, so let me also say one D. You mean so you mean one plus one D or one dimension? No, no, a line defect. Like ah. you just take. So the story uh... for line defect is a bit different. In fact, um, so in one dimension, for instance, quantum mechanics, you can always have a qubit, which transforms under S two N symmetry. Yes. It's a ground state degeneracy. And that's a trivial example of symmetry breaking. So some mm -hmm. two dimension is more constrained in one dimension. So about one dimension I didn't talk about. There is some story, but it's more involved. No, but I was I was mentioned. I mean, I thought that you it was one of your questions in uh, the your last slide about what about. Uh, yeah, uh, so I think so. I, I think ah, sorry, in this case, yeah. So in one why... dimension, there, there's gonna be some story, but it must be more, must have more assumptions because already quantum mechanics takes more assumption than uh, to yes. prove something. So you're right. I don't know what are the right assumptions. I mean, I guess I, I'm I'm cheating because, uh, in fact, of course, uh, one thing long range is long range. So there is a no, no. But one thing long range, as you said, you can think of it as a line. Defect. Let me tell you. Also, in the work with Zohar on line defects, we construct an example which are effectively exhibit symmetry breaking on line defects, and they are all <laughs> starting from this trick of coupling. Uh, um bulk uh, free field to a line defect that you can think as a non-local one-dimensional model yes yes, so, yes. yeah and the story on line defects must be more i think what i had in mind is more different kind of questions mm -hmm. so like there is some idea that um so for instance if you have a defect that breaks a z2 symmetry you can take the superposition the linear combination of the defect breaking the z2 symmetry in one direction the one breaking z2 symmetry in another direction and then mm -hmm. you and then you can ask, uh, will this eventually decay physically to uh, one of them? So this means it's something about the scale dimension defect changing operator between the Z2 breaking one direction, Z2 in the other. So there is some yes. idea that the scale dimension of this operator must be correlated to the value of the G function for the RG flow to be consistent. Mm -hmm. These are just some questions some people have been asking. I think there are checks of some of these ideas like for this fuzzy sphere. But there are no no proofs, so mm -hmm. I think this. Yeah, I think online defects agree. The story probably you cannot prove a sharp theorem, but you, there is probably something to say on this sort of line. Thing. No, but I agree with you. I mean, certainly there are more assumptions, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So, well, thank you very much. Uh, um, are there any other questions from the audience? So if not, we we thank uh, Gabriel again and uh, Gabriel. Thank, thank you, you very much, much for, uh, for the talk, Gabriel. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you. Thank bye you bye. so, so thank much. You. Bye 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 bye.